first of all, it, it was underwater, underhand, and damned un-English. That's what they said in Parliament about it. So that's a pretty good indication of what the public thought. Underhand, because you couldn't, you were hitting below the belt. Uh, you know, you were coming, you, you, you were supposed in those days to declare war, sail your fleets together, open fire and you'd pound each other to bits, but it wasn't that good suddenly. And suddenly these German U-boats uh, came along and started sinking things. And that was first evidence merely a month after World War I broke out in 1914 by the German U-9, a pathetic little submarine really, driven by a paraffin engine who came out of, uh, of harbour and found three British cruisers, the Aboukir, the Cressy and the Home, patrolling in stately fashion, perfect station keeping, of course, and looking very smart. As one of those German U-boat, he sank those three British cruisers with a greater loss of life than that suffered by Admiral Lord Nelson's entire fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar uh, a, a century before. But the plain fact is it brought to the Admiralty's mind for the first thing that the submarine was a real threat. No longer were they our waters, or your waters, or German waters. They were nobody's particular waters so long as a submarine might be underneath those waters. <laughs> During the course of two world wars, submarines turned ocean into no man's land. Nowhere was their impact more evident than in the Pacific War. American submariners, only 2% of the U.S. Navy's total forces, sank one half of Japan's merchant shipping fleet and a third of the Imperial Navy's warships. But for their efforts, the submariners paid a heavy price. Every time they would come down the torpedo wakes and you get depth charge. And the depth charge is a very unpleasant experience. So then you would surface and make another end round. There was never any hesitancy at all on going in again. And the crew was all for it, knowing they're going to get depth charge. But it's the old, it's the old business of, of uh, well, General MacArthur is a uh, duty, honor before... For, I don't know what it was, but anyway, <laughs> you do your duty in spite of the fact, and anybody who didn't get scared of the depth charge attack was a damn fool. A lot of people took, uh, kept a diary. I didn't keep a diary, and I didn't take any pictures because I, I really didn't expect to survive the war. I mean, we, had, we knew that uh, one out of five patrols people were lost. I mean, th that was your life expectancy. When you get after five patrols, well, you fi figure your uh, number's about ready to come up, you know? Anti-submarine forces took full advantage of the submarine's vulnerability. Submarines, after all, were merely surface ships that could submerge for only a few hours. Their underwater speed was little more than a crawl. As a result, the submarine navy lost a higher percentage of its men than any other branch of service. By war's end, naval tacticians knew that submarine performance had to be improved. Instead, it was revolutionized. Moored alongside a conventional type, the Adam submarine Nautilus displays her size as the Navy takes the wraps off its prized possession for newsreel cameramen. And here are the intricate controls that guide the huge craft like a baby carriage. These pictures were made during a cruise from the Nautilus home port of Groton, Connecticut, to New York. Already the Nautilus has traveled 21,000 miles since commissioning, most of it submerged. Although the Nautilus... The Nautilus was a fabulous development. It was a true submarine that could proceed at high speed for great distances, where submarines before were only ships, surface ships, that could submerge, be uh, hard to detect then, but and operate for short distances. 
We had a ship that was immediately better than anything for combat purposes. A completely new era in sea warfare opens. This ship, with its global range and ultimate stealth, was a weapon ideally suited for the emerging strategies of defense. Remarkably, the revolutionary power plant was conceived, designed, and made operational without incident in less than eight years. We really had support. If we needed some technical information done, if you phoned, there was somebody to talk to at four in the morning, a truck would roll or a plane would fly to get you apart or anything you needed. That was a hard driving, take a chance, get it done outfit. And why was it that way? It was all on account of that man Rickover. Hyman G. Rickover, one of the most enigmatic and powerful leaders in U.S. military history. He not only mastered the complexities of putting nuclear power on submarines, but he also mastered the complexities of the federal bureaucracy, which would fund his vision. At the height of his power, Rickover made every decision there was to make about the developing nuclear program. From the design of the reactor to the makeup of the men who would operate and command his ships. His point-blank personality is legendary. I think you want this down some, don't you? No? Should I start in all over again? Thank you. The project will be under the direction of the AEC Reactor Development Division, and my boss, Dr. Lawrence Hafstad, has assigned the immediate responsibility to me. The Admiral had total control over the officers in the program, and I'm not sure he didn't keep a close eye on the enlisted people as well. What it was, was a, a grilling in which he attempted to elicit some of your personal characteristics. What kind of books do you read? How many have you read in the last year? What do you do in your spare time? And why do you have spare time? Why aren't you working all the time? Uh, he made it as really as uncomfortable for the interviewee as he possibly could. The trouble with you is you want easy answers, but you don't know the proper questions. Perhaps the question should be, what should be the role of educated or intellectual people in the United States? Now, does that sound like a better question? You can pick any letter of the alphabet and put down an adjective, and it'll apply to Rickover. It'll be arrogant, belligerent, contentious, all the way Z to zealot, whatever you want. It'll apply. Yeah, let me tell you that his principal legacy, in my judgment, was to reinforce many of the fundamental instincts that have served submarine force well all along. The sense of personal responsibility that's a critical part of being a submarine skipper, that business of a personal responsibility which cannot be shared, cannot be shared, is part of his legacy. Why didn't you think about it at the time and start something? Well, unfortunately, the time that you started in nuclear power in 1946, I was being born. So um, I, I, I admit that I'm coming to the issue late, all right? But well, it's, you're it's the no rising concern generation. You have, I, I know I defer to you, but we have felt this responsibility, but there are many things that should be done that aren't done. And I said, Lou, who is this character? Tell me about him. I got a definition of Rickover then in 1948 that went like this. There's a part that's good, there's a part that's bad, and there's a part you wouldn't believe. And in my whole interaction with Rickover from 48 through 74 and later, I never heard a better definition than that.